Right, so I'll go back to software only, and I'll talk about implementing branching program obfuscation using graph-induced graded encoding. Uh, that's joint work with uh, Tsipora Halevi, who's now in Brooklyn College, uh, Victor Shoup from NYU and IBM, and Noah Stefans Davidovich from NYU. Um, so we're talking about uh, program obfuscation, uh, and this entire session was about similar things, so you should be familiar with it by now. The point is making a program unintelligible. So you want to, you take a program, you want to encrypt it in such a way that only the functionality of that program is still visible and every inner working uh, are uh, hidden. Uh, the thing that you can do with obfuscation is hide uh, secrets in software, for example, cryptographic key, or maybe the algorithm that you're using or something like that. And the thing that we're trying to get is a general purpose obfuscating compiler. You give it an arbitrary program, uh, it spits out an obfuscated one with the same functionality and hopefully not too much slower than the original one. Uh, so that's what we want. Uh, it's useful. Uh, so in the previous talks, uh, we heard all kind of examples. I'm not gonna give examples. I'm just gonna show uh, the results of a Google search that I did a couple of months ago. You can get an obfuscator uh, for s up to 77% off, um, apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the commercial obfuscators are absolutely available. They're actually very useful, but what they have is ki any kind of heuristic who try to make debugging and reverse engineering harder. It's sort of a commonly accepted uh, uh, truth that uh, if you take any of them and you have enough manpower and debugging power at your disposal, you will be able to break them, uh, which brings up the questions, can we get something as strong to break as it is, let's say, to break RSA? I mean, can we get crypto strength uh, obfuscation? Um, and that's the, uh, so we want cryptographic obfuscation. And for a while, I think all of us thought that uh, that's probably impossible. Uh, until a couple of years ago when this construction of uh, Gargit Al for the first time um, showed a plausible way of constructing such cryptographic uh, obfuscators. Uh, and we have many construction, we had many constructions since then. Uh, security is not well understood. I'll go, I'll get back to it a little bit later on. Uh, but at least it's plausible that these things are secure uh, and they give you this crypto strength type of uh, thing. Uh, all of these construction, every single one of them actually, works in sort of steps. You have some core simple functions that you obfuscate directly with whatever crypto tools you're using, and then a whole bunch of other transformations on top of it to transform this simple class of functions into the ability to obfuscate everything. Uh, and the transformations, by and large, use tools from crypto that are more traditional, we feel more comfortable with homomorphic encryption, non-interactive zero knowledge, they might be randomized encoding, they might be heavy in some cases, but we sort of feel that we understand their security quite well. Uh, the core one, not so much. The core one is where uh, a lot of uh, magic happens and, and sort of black art. Um, how do we obfuscate this core thing? Uh, so the main tool there is uh, graded encoding, also called multilinear map sometimes. Uh, and um, Brent talked a little bit about what these are. I will talk a little bit about the specific uh, variant that we're using here a little later. But for now, the most important thing to remember, they're sort of like homomorphic encryption. You can encrypt or encode in this case the quantities that you care about. Uh, these would be hidden, but you can still manipulate them even in this, enco in, in this encoded uh, format. Uh, the main difference between uh, graded encoding and homomorphic encryption is once you have one of these encodings, if it happens to encode a zero, you can see it. Uh, so you can think about it as similar to discrete log. Right? You can exponentiate, and then you don't know the thing in the exponent unless it's a zero. If the thing in the exponent is a zero, you can look at it and see that it what you have in your hand is a one, uh, and you'd know that. So in that sense, it's similar. Uh, so suppose we had that. Suppose we had these graded encoding schemes that would let us uh, encode things and still manipulate, then a very natural way of obfuscating a program is, well, encode all of the quantities that the program is interested in, and then just run 
this uh, whatever program you have uh, manipulate the, the data as you would in the clear, except manipulated in the encoded format, and at the end check to see if the result is a zero or not. So that would let you uh, obfuscate uh, functions. Uh, but the main problem with that approach is that it's not only at the end that you can check if it's a zero or not. An attacker who tried to attack your obfuscation would be able to see whenever two intermediate values are the same. Because these are manipulate, you can manipulate them, so you can subtract any two intermediate value, and then you can check if the result is a zero, and now you know that two intermediates inside of your program from the same execution, from two different ex executions, doesn't matter, you would know that they're the same, and that leaks information about the inner workings of your algorithm, which is exactly the thing you're trying to hide. Um, so the, in order to overcome that, you use randomization, and I'll get back to what kind of randomizations we are using a little later. Uh, the challenges in software obfuscation, cryptographic software obfuscation in general purpose, the one that I already mentioned is that security is poorly understood. That's mainly because the security of the graded encoding schemes that we use is poorly understood. Uh, the other problem is it's extremely expensive. Brent talked about it uh, before. You cannot, you have this multilinearity degree parameter and things grow very, very quickly with that parameter. Um, and uh, you cannot get beyond 100. And in the context that I'm talking about, you cannot even get beyond 20, I think. Uh, but uh, so this, this is extremely expensive. And moreover, there are other parts, even in the core obfuscator, that would make it even more expensive. Uh, the implementation attempts before this work that, uh, work that I'm talking about uh, the original one, uh, there was work by upon uh, uh, the first, trying to Im uh, implement the first type of uh, uh, obfuscation candidates that we came up with. Uh, they were able to obfuscate a point function of 14 bits. That's, I have a secret of 14 bits. I'm sort of hashing it down, and everybody that has the secret can check it. But if you don't have the secret, then you can't check it. But it's 14 bits. If you don't have the secret, just brute force it. Um, the, and then there was the 5-gen uh, work from CCS of last year uh, where they were able to obfuscate uh, a point function of 80 bits or even more. Uh, it's, if you want to do it efficiently, efficiently, you probably need to do some uh, um, trade-offs that I'll mention in the context of our work later on. Uh, but one point that I want to make about obfuscating point functions, you can hash them down, maybe with some salt, this is a practical solution that actually works. So we don't try to build general purpose obfuscation for the purpose of obfuscating point function. That would be silly. Point function is a nice test case, but it's not a nice target in terms of what is it that we want to obfuscate. That we can do in other, by other means. So the big question essentially is, can current obfuscation techniques, software only obfuscation techniques, feasibly obfuscate anything non-trivial. And by anything non-trivial, I mean, A, you shouldn't be able to brute force it, and B, we shouldn't have much simpler solution for doing the same thing. So let me pick on the 5 Gen C uh, for just one second. It's awesome to obfuscate a real pseudorandom function, even if the input is 12 bits. But for that particular purpose, we have a much easier solution. Just go over all two to the 12th values and store them in a table, right? So I want something that can obfuscate a function for which A, we can't brute force uh, by an adversary, and B, there are no simpler solutions of that for form. And before the work that I'm talking about right now, I don't think that we had any examples like that. Uh, and the answer that I have from this thing is yes-ish. Uh, we can obfuscate read once branching program. Uh, these are essentially the same thing as non-deterministic finite automata, uh, where we can handle automatas of about 100 states, maybe 200, uh, and up to 80-bit inputs. Truth be told, we cannot handle 80-bit input, but we can handle 20 nibbles. Uh, so the length of the in input is still, to the, uh, is still 80, and they'll still have 2 to the 80 of them, which is too much to store in a table. Uh, so that's for non-triviality. Uh, these things can handle things like super string 
Techno match, substring match, fuzzy match, uh, where the length of your strings are too big to brute force. So in that sense, at least as a class, there is no adversary that breaks them by brute force. So what we use technically is the graph-induced encoding scheme of uh, Gorbunov et al. Uh, from 2015, whereas all previous implementations used a different uh, graded encoding scheme uh, due to Koron, uh, Lokwan, and uh, Tibochi. Uh, the uh, Gorbunov gentry Levy scheme from 2015, uh, that seems to be a little better for non-deterministic finite automata of many states, and the reason is Yeah, but it's too big. Yeah, it's just too big to brute force. Yes. Uh, yeah, they do have canonical representation. It's just big. Uh, they're better for an optimistic finite automata of many states because you can encode whole matrices in one shot as opposed to having to encode each individual entry of the matrix. So you get some amortization this way. Uh, for performance, so GGH15 had two parts. There was the suggestion of the uh, graded encoding and another suggestion of how to use it to do obfuscation. We couldn't actually implement everything that GGH15 suggested for doing obfuscation for performance reasons. I'll touch a little bit about it a little later. Uh, but the, there was a technique there called bundling factor that we could not implement. And as a result, this uh, implementation is insecure if you want to use it to handle arbitrary branching program, uh, it's only plausibly secure if you're using it to obfuscate read once branching program. Again, I'll talk a little bit about it later. Uh, so I have lots of time, so I'm going to show you all the gory, well, not all the gory, but I'm going to show you a little bit. Um, so first of all, what is the object that we're trying to obfuscate? Uh, branching programs or non-deterministic finite automata. For the purpose of that talk, these are essentially just graphs. And these graphs are represented uh, by uh, their transition matrices. And what we need to do is to hide those matrices while allowing to multiply these matrices in a predetermined order and check for zero. So I'm going to give you eventually a whole lunch, bunch of encoded matrices, uh, and they have, they're going to be ordered, they're going to be a bunch of matrices for the first entry, a bunch of matrices for the second, etc. And then during evaluation, I'm going to choose one matrix from each position, multiply them all, check if the result is zero. That's what I need to do, and I want to hide the matrices in themselves. The matrices are my plain text. Uh, the first thing we need to do, and I said it before, is to randomize things. I mean, we want to make sure that we hide intermediate value. So you cannot check whether a particular subset product of things is equal to any other subset product. So we're going to randomize it, and the, we're going to randomize it essentially in two ways. The first way is Killian-style randomization, where if I wanted to uh, randomize M1, M2, and M3, and I know that eventually I might need to multiply them all, what I can do is choose R1 and R2 that are random and invertible, and instead of giving you M1, I'll give you M1 times R1, and instead of giving you M2, I'll give you R1 inverse times M2 times R2, etc. So if I ever need to multiply them, all the Rs will cancel out, and I'll get the right product but each matrix individually is random. Uh, one thing that I want to say, I probably should have should had that in, on the slide, if I'm going to multiply M2 by possibly one of two matrices, M1 or M1 prime, I'm going to have to use the same R1 to multiply M1 as I do M1 prime, because I don't know which of them I'm going to multiply into M2. So this is one uh, method of randomization. The other one is embedding things in a higher dimension matrices. So I'm taking the matrix that I want to uh, encode, and I embed it in a bigger matrix, some of whose entries are random, uh, but I keep some dimensions only for the plain text. And so this way, the matrix is more randomized, even if two intermediate results are equal in the plain text version, the randomized version will not be equal. And at the end, I'm going to project everything to the space that only contains the plain text, so I get the right answer. That's essentially what's happening. Uh, and then I'm in after I randomize these matrices, I get matrices that are slightly bigger. 
and random, and those I'm going to use the graded encoding in order to enc encode. Uh, GGH15 had one more method of randomization where you multiply these matrices by constants that multiply up to one, uh, out to one uh, in certain uh, ways. Uh, this we could not implement here, and the reason is these constants have to be small. So if we used integers to multiply them, uh, this would not give us any security because we won't have enough randomness in those integers. Uh, so GGH15 suggested to go and work over a bigger extension field and choose your um, constants from there, and then you can have them have low norm but still have high entropy. But that means that the dimension of everything has to be blown up by the degree of the extension, and we couldn't afford it. We could barely implement that. We definitely couldn't afford a 100x in increase in, our, in the dimension that we handled. Uh, so that's why a certain type of uh, mix and match attacks that these constants were supposed to throw uh, are still uh, possible against this con our implementation. And the only way to use it safely is in a context where that mix and mass attack doesn't apply, namely read one branching program. Uh, let me spend one slide talking about the GGH15 uh, graph-induced graded encoding schemes. Uh, suppose I wanted to encode n matrices, and I know the order, m1, m2, m3. If I want to multiply them, I will multiply them in order. Uh, what I do is I choose n plus 1 random matrices, a0 through an. I'm thinking about them as a chain. Uh, where I have the A's in the, gra in the nodes of the chain and the M's, the plain text, we're going to sit somewhere on the edges. Um, and now if I want to encode, so the A's, are now a param the A's are now a parameter, and if I want to encode MI relative to the edge from AI minus 1 to AI, then what I do is I add a little bit noise uh, and I compute MI times AI plus this noise. This gives me a matrix. And now I'm going to solve uh, the equation AI minus 1 times CI equals that. Uh, I'm going to solve it for the matrix CI, and the matrix CI would represent, would encode my matrix MI. So it's a way to uh, represent MI in a way that's not obvious. And the reason it's not obvious is because MI, AI plus EI is sort of an LWE looking expression. If mi has enough entropy in it, that thing should look pseudorandom. Um, the thing that makes it really hard is not only I need to solve for these CIs, I need to find a small solution. And finding a small solution to a system of linear equation is a notoriously hard problem. Actually, this is the main problem underlying all of uh, lattice-based crypto. And if I wanted to do that, I needed some help. So I'm actually going to choose these AI matrices with some trapdoors that allow me to do that when I need to encode. Uh, the only thing important sort of in, in this uh, uh, slide is the red line. This is my invariant, and encoding satisfies this, and as I manipulate encoding, I always need to maintain that invariant. Um, and it's not particularly hard, a couple of lines of algebra, to see that if you multiply uh, several CIs, what you get is an encoding of the corresponding multiplication of the MIs relative to the path from the first to the last matrix AI. AI. And that means that, in particular, if you multiply all of them uh, from C1 and on, then you get C star uh, which satisfy the same red equality, which means that if the product of all the M's was a zero, then A0 times C star would be just the noise. So the way to check if you have an encoding of zero is you publish A0 as part of the parameters of the system, uh, and then you multiply A0 by your encoding and check if the result is small, and if it is, then it was an encoding of zero, and otherwise it is not. So that's the GGH15 encoding scheme. Um, and the bulk of the work that we did was to implement it. And the hard part, as I said, is solving for AI minus 1 times CI equals whatever it is. Uh, and we need to solve it for a low norm CI. And it requires a trapdoor. 
So you need to implement both things. You need to implement the choice of the matrix with the trapdoor. And over there, we use the variant of the trapdoor sampling uh, procedure from uh, Michancio and, and Paycard, uh, where the variations that we used, we used a, uh, slightly different algorithms for, uh, uh, for sampling from a high dimensional Gau Gaussian in a, in a lattice. The main reason we use that variant is it's easier to implement than others. It's slightly worse in terms of its performance profile, but not in a way that would make a real difference in the things that we're trying to do. Uh, and we had a lot of optimizations of working in integers in Chinese remaindering representation without having to translate them back and forth uh, to the, the canonical representation, uh, which was important because the numbers are big and you don't want this conversion is expensive. Uh, we had a lot of optimizations of multiplying very large matrices, and when I say very large, writing down a matrix like that is about 18 gigabytes, and now you need to multiply two of them. It's a lot of work. Uh, so actually, these optimizations specifically are implemented uh, uh, in the NTA library, so they're available in, as a general purpose thing. Uh, and we had many lower level optimization, like a stash to reduce the number of samples. You have, we use rejection sampling, so whenever you reject something, instead of throwing it out, you put it in a stash, and next time you check if you need it, uh, if you have it. Uh, let me just uh, describe the, how do you work with uh, Chinese remainder in representation, because I think it's nice, and maybe it's general purpose. So a general, uh, one of the tasks in, uh, in the sampling thing is uh, you have uh, a target number u, mod q, and you have this uh, radix representation G, a mixed radix representation G, and essentially you want to find the representation of U in that mi mixed radix, except you want to have a randomized representation. And this is essentially the uh, a procedure for McChanchi and, and Picard. Uh, I want to just point out that you work with U in CRT representations, so you never had the number, you only have its CRT representation, and line two in that slide asks you to update that. So how do you do that is the main challenge. And the observation is that it's sort of easy because uh, these QIs are uh, co-prime. So uh, you need to, the, the problem is you need to divide by one of these QIs. And the observation is that by the time you need that, the i coordinate is not no longer important, so you don't need to update it. And all the others, it's easy to update. Uh, just to see a few performance numbers. Uh, if you work over bits, so the time to obfuscate a, a branching program that reads 20 bits uh, is like 68 hours. And actually, initially, we couldn't do that because our machine only had 400 gigabytes of RAM. So we had to move to a uh, bigger machine that has uh, like a terabyte of RAM, and that, that was fine. Um, it takes, okay. Uh, but as, as I said before, obfuscating 20 bit, something with 20 bit inputs is not very interesting because you can always write a table with all the answers. So you want to obfuscate something with more bits of input, and we can't really increase the multilinearity degree to 80, so, but we can work with nibbles. So it gives us the equivalent of uh, uh, 80 bit input. The obfuscation time, the disk usage is eight times bigger. Uh, but everything else remains the same, so we can uh, work with the amount of RAM that we have. Uh, and to handle 80 bits, to handle 20 nibbles, uh, the initialization would be a couple of hours. The obfuscation would be about three weeks. You can do it, it just takes a long time. Uh, evaluation is just half an hour or something. Uh, RAM usage, well, maybe 400 gigabytes, and the uh, disk space is uh, writing down the obfuscation would take you 10 terabytes. Well, there are disks that big, so it's possible. Uh, so conclusions, uh, cryptographic general purpose obfuscation is feasible, but only barely. You can do things that are non-trivial, but just so. Um, the thing that we could have is up to 20 characters, which is 80 bits. There is a new generation of obfuscation construction, starting from the work of Rachel Lynn, uh, that are emerging now. I'm not aware of anybody who tried to implement them. I don't know 
if they're going to be better or worse than this. Uh, the security story is a little better for those things. We understand the security a little better. So that's a good thing about them. I don't know if they're feasible or not. Uh, and with that, I will stop.